thanks for inviting me to be here. As Natalie said, my name is Carmen Mazera, and I serve as executive director of a group called APSIA, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. We're the community of schools around the world that specialize in international affairs, much like UCSD's own School of Global Policy and Strategy, which is actually one of our founding members. Natalie asked me to talk with you a little bit about the many, many things that you can do in the careers of international affairs. So I have some slides to unpack that. I also have the questions you shared in advance, but more than anything, I wanna make sure this delivers the stuff that you actually wanna know. So as I go through, please feel free to put questions in the chat box. I won't be able to see them when I'm sharing my screen, but I promise I'll come back to them as soon as I can to make sure that you all get out of this what you need. I'll also share a link to our career guide that we have on our site. So if there's something you wanna learn more deeply about, we unpack lots of different options on our site, offer some tips about how to get into the field and then some, suggest some different organizations too. So with that, let me share my slides here. Can I get a quick thumbs up if folks can actually see my screen? Thank you, Christina. All right, so one of the blessings and one of the curses about the field of international affairs is that it really encompasses so many different elements. By design, an international affairs school is what we call interdisciplinary. So it looks at the questions of the world with a lens of politics and culture and history and economics and language and social, social issues and all of these different pieces under one big umbrella because the world is complicated and it's interconnected. So there may be fields that you're familiar with, things like diplomacy or defense or development, that might be fields that are more traditional, but there is a global and an international element to communications. Many marketing firms are trying to figure out how they cater to a global audience and have demand for international affairs specialists. The same is certainly true within all of the different fields of business and banking and finance, FinTech, all of those different components have a global element to them whether it's trying to create or service a customer base, trying to navigate regulation, trying to create products that are gonna be marketable across borders, all of those different things fall under those types of categories. Issues of energy and the environment obviously cross national borders and so therefore have a global element to them. There's the obvious things like climate change, but also pipelines and solar and, and regulations and pollution and all of those different pieces fall under the careers of international affairs. Some of you might be interested in international education, and that might be helping students and or professionals cross borders on exchanges. Some of that might be about bringing global content into classrooms. All of that also falls under the umbrella of international affairs. Some of you might be wondering about questions of human rights. It could be, again, from a business perspective, how do we get Apple or Mars chocolate bars to do less shady things in their supply chains? Some of it might be about warring parties and trying to make sure and protect civilians in conflict. All of those different pieces um, can fall under that broader umbrella of, of international affairs. So there's those elements within us as well. Matters of science and technology obviously have very specific implications for our global society. Again, it could be with a policy lens. What does AI mean and what is, how does that shape government regulation? It might be about how technology facilitates conversations or communications or the transfers of goods and services across borders. Most people don't think of NATO, for those of you who know what the, the NATO Alliance is, as a science and technology body, but that global international alliance actually has a huge element dealing with environmental questions and science diplomacy and science cooperation. So those kinds of fields also have an international affairs element to them. And then of course, again, those traditional fields like security and defense and diplomacy that may be a little bit better known. So how might you know whether a career in international affairs makes sense? Some of the common things that we hear are that it's really for a field where people like tackling big challenges. Again, because all of these issues are knotted together and wound together, something like poverty or the environment or disease, which are all also interrelated. If you like unpacking those big complicated issues, an interdisciplinary field like international affairs may make of maybe a really good fit for you because it too brings together all of those different elements. Maybe you feel called to service and you wanna help people or, or do something bigger and broader than yourself. Those sorts of elements, because the nature of international affairs is about how we're interconnected, about how what happens to you has implications for me and what happens to me has implications for you. 
those sorts of folks often find a home in international affairs as well because of that global element to what we do. By definition, people who are curious about the world and want to travel and love language and culture, for some people, the gateway drug might be sports, it might be food, it might be all of those different things. But if you're curious about why the world is the way it is or how people are in other places, international affairs is definitely a, a great home for you. Perhaps not just in the current election environment, but bigger and broader than that, you're, question, you're curious about the implications of policies and how structures and systems and laws impact different people in different places and how decisions by a policymaker is going to shape the way the world moves forward. All of those sorts of things are absolutely within the wheelhouse of international affairs. It might be on the local level that has global, that has international elements, national, state, federal, county, and then obviously the big intergovernmental organizations. All of those different pieces are, benefit from the training that an international affairs program is going to provide and that you can find with an international affairs career. It could just be that you like to argue. I used to tell people I want to travel the world and argue. And so this was how I knew that this was my home. See, Christina's laughing. She's clearly, she and I are clearly uh, sharing that particular connection. This, so if you like unpacking, again, those naughty issues where there's all these different sides and perspectives and you have to draw on all of those different elements that you've learned about within your interdisciplinary program, these kinds of fields might be the right place for you. So again, if you like taking apart complex issues and trying to move them forward, this is absolutely a home for you because a lot of our work really is about transforming the world. We may disagree on what we want to see the world look like, but I think all of our schools and all of our students and graduates really share that call to help make the world better how they see it and trying to really move different issues forward. So particularly as a student, you might be thinking about your majors and your interests. And again, there's so many different pieces that come together within the field of international affairs. I'm not gonna read this very full slide to you and I'll make sure that Natalie has it. But for example, if you're interested in history, particularly in a part of the world and you're interested in business, there's a whole field called political risk analysis where you're trying to look at a situation, look at the world, draw on that historical knowledge as well as all of the different factors going on in a particular region and understand what that might mean for a particular business or sector. So that can bring together lots of those different interests that you have just within that specific career track. Maybe you're studying engineering and you wanna work on combating poverty. So you can go in and be what we call a monitoring and evaluation expert, someone who looks at how a development project is set up, tries to understand what works, what doesn't, how that particular project delivers on those goals, and then what needs to be changed to help it deliver better. But it might come from a really structural and engineering point of view. Maybe you're interested in human rights, as we talked about earlier, and, and then you wanna couple that with an interest in education. So someone who works in refugee communities, whether they're in country, the, trying to, to stay where, close to where they are while a conflict is going on, or maybe they've been relocated somewhere else. Someone who can bring together those different interests and really support what happens in that particular com very vulnerable community comes from and can be part of a career in international affairs. So again, there's so many different elements and so many different paths forward that whatever kinds of majors and interests you're trying to combine, there can be an international element and an international career there for you. And as, as I talked about, we have a whole section on our site that unpacks more of this. And I'll make sure Natalie also has a handout that we have that goes into a little bit more depth about these different kinds of sectors and also pieces together some different majors that may be a good fit for you. So, come on slides. My computer has just, there we go. So if you're looking for a career in international affairs, what kinds of traits and skills are you going to need? You're going to need some kind of experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be a postgraduate job, but an internship, a volunteer experience, maybe research with a faculty member. We can talk about lots of ways that you can do that, even in a COVID environment, if you can't leave your house or you can't leave your, your small community, but some kind of experience that's going to expose you to the professional work life, as well as many different things so that you can get a sense of what makes the most sense for you. You need to be able to speak well in front of lots of different kinds of audiences and you need to be able to write clearly and concisely. Part of that is because even if you know all that there is to know about a particular subject, 
if you can't convey it both in written form and out loud, it doesn't do you any good to have all of that information in your head. So if these are things that you currently struggle with, now while you're a student is a critical time to start to build those skill sets. So if you're uncomfortable speaking in front of a group of people, volunteer to be the one who gives the presentation in class. If you're not sure about your writing, I'm sure even again in COVID, your school's writing centers or support from your professors is gonna help you sharpen that writing. So those two are really important skills, particularly in our field where so much is, is, has to be communicated. But I would say across any sector, building those two skill sets now, while you have an environment where you can make some mistakes and have people help you is really important. If you're able to gain language proficiency in a, in a language outside of your own, that is also really a great asset to have, um, partially just from a respect and a functional point of view, but also being able to really delve more deeply into issues on your own rather than to have something happen through a translator. Not only is foreign language experience really helpful, but understanding what information and data is telling you. If you are not a super data human, still you need to unpack and be able to understand and analyze what kinds of information comes your way. So some are the people who are doing the deep data analysis, but pretty much everyone in our field is someone who has to understand the information. So that kind of basic skill set, what sorts of sources did they use? What were the questions that they asked? What are the trends that come out of this particular information? All of that is a really important skill set, whether you're interested in the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, you want to go work for the UN as a multilateral, all of those agencies are going to have to have people who understand what information is telling them. You need to understand how an idea in your head becomes a reality. So it's not just enough to go, man, wouldn't it be awesome if this happened? Can you translate that idea and move it along the path from step A to B to C to Z? It could be something in your school club, it could be something in your faith community, it could be something locally, it could be a massive multi-bajillion dollar project at a bank. All of those things are very useful for being able to, to showcase what you can do and what you can be responsible for. <clears throat> the other thing I think you would need, again, no matter what kind of sector you wanna go into, is a network of people that can support you and help you. It's gonna be staff like Natalie, it might be faculty, it might be UCSD alum, it might be each other, other interns of, uh, that you served with. All of those people can provide you really useful information. Some of it might be really practical, like, hey, there's this job that I know about. Some of it might be broader, like, oh, I'm really interested in this. Is this a field? Who's in this space? That whole slide I showed you earlier of how all those different majors and pieces come together. So there's lots of different information that you can glean because of the network that you have. So we talked a little bit about this, but how do you get those kinds of experiences? Some of it's internships, some of it could be work study on the professional experience side. Again, exposure to how an office runs, exposure to different questions, all of those kinds of really practical skills that come from just being in a professional setting. In terms of your writing or your language proficiency or your oral communication skills, it might come from study abroad when we're able to do that again. It might come from fellowships and different opportunities. And if you're not sure whether you really want to be competitive or, or if you can be competitive, it always is beneficial to try and to see what sorts of opportunities make sense to pursue. And I'm happy to talk more about that as well. On the data and the analytical side, maybe it comes from your coursework. If you are a little unsure about your quantitative skills, maybe you really try to include that in a paper that you have, or you seek out that class that you know is going to push and challenge you to build up that particular skill set. Maybe you try to take a piece that you've written and you get it published. There's lots of journals that are looking for undergraduate work. So it's a great way to showcase what you've done. And maybe you'll get some feedback about the analysis or the trends work or the actual data running that you did to help build up that particular piece. I talked a little bit about program management, but there's also things that you can do internationally to run a project like in Peace Corps, domestically in the US with things like Volunteer Corps, there are a million small organizations who would benefit from your time and effort if you want to take ownership of a project as a volunteer. So again, there's lots of ways to get that really practical hands-on experience that's going to deliver for you a good perspective as well as competitiveness for different jobs and for grad school. In addition to all the folks I've talked about in terms of building your network, like your classmates and your faculty, there's a million young professionals groups out there as well that are global or national 
So if you are interested in a particular subject like energy or transportation or foreign policy, there's a young professionals group for that. Depending on how you identify yourself, there's women in international security, uh, you know, women of color advancing peace and security. So even just within these, the security space, there's about five bajillion groups with different subsegments. So you can always find a young professionals group. You can always find a LinkedIn group to join. For those of you who are interested in international education, there's a LinkedIn group for that. All of these different pieces uh, and build up the kinds of intel you can gather to shape your own professional choices. COVID has obviously thrown a monkey wrench into a lot of these different things. So as you think about the kinds of experiences you wanted to have in a non-pandemic world, there are a lot of ways to still get that kind of experience in a pandemic world. Lots and lots of organizations have turned to remote internships. So there's plenty of ways to get very practical experience and exposure from your, your house in your jammies whenever you can do the work that they're looking for. And in some ways, it's a great chance for you to have exposure to organizations that maybe are not in San Diego, but are casting a nationwide net for interns. And so now you can compete for positions that maybe you would not have been able to do before because you had to be in DC or New York or Denver or wherever. So there's a lot of great remote internship and volunteering experiences out there that would not have been there if it weren't for the pandemic. Locally in your community, there are again, lots of ways to get experience working with other people, practicing your language skills, doing writing and, and doing oral presentations. So even within your town, and, and for those of you who maybe aren't in San Diego, wherever you are, there are going to be lots of opportunities. If you have a language skill and you don't want to lose it, there's tons of folks doing phone banking to check on different populations to make sure that they're safe and protected. There's canvassing to, to do contact tracing, all of which might be done in, in whatever language it is that you're trying to practice. So there's lots of ways, again, even during a pandemic, to keep up those skills, to keep those, those different practice, to keep practicing those particular skills. I mentioned all the undergraduate journals. There's a million blogs. There's research publications you can work with, faculty who will do research for you. You can keep up that data analysis. You can keep up that particular depth of work that you wanted to be doing. And all of it can be done remotely so the pandemic doesn't necessarily come into play. Lots of organizations are looking for project management, freelancers, contractors, and we can talk about different sites where you can look to that information if you're interested. But again, a lot of it is remote now and there's a lot of stuff that's accessible that would not have been previously. The same thing is true for building up your network. Tons of organizations have pivoted their events online. So what would have previously been a panel discussion on chemical weapons that would have only been in person in DC can now be broadcast to the world. So you can go, you can participate, you can see who the speakers are, and if they give you the opportunity afterwards, you can follow up with them, or you can gain their email address and write to them and say, oh, so-and-so, I saw you speak on the Brookings panel on chemical weapons. I really liked your point about this. I'd love to talk to you about that. So it's a way to continue to build out your network to be present where these conversations are happening, but all of it is remote because everybody has pivoted online. And that's true for US-based events and non-US-based events. So you can really participate in things worldwide in a way that you would not have been able to do before. And the same thing is true whether it's an online meetup and everybody's getting together on Zoom, discussion boards if you're just totally Zoomed out, lots of different ways to continue to contribute your perspective and gain information and build up that network even during the pandemic. So, as you start to think about putting together an application for a job or an internship, and in a lot of ways for graduate school too, and I'm happy to talk about that if you like, it's really important to pay strict attention to what an employer is looking for. Most cases, they're gonna be looking for a cover letter. They're gonna be looking for a resume. Some cases, they might be looking for transcripts from the different institutions you've attended. If you've only been at UCSD, great. If you did study abroad in the before times and you directly enrolled in an institution and you need those transcripts, you're gonna to need to ask for them. And because of COVID, you're gonna to need to build in extra time to make sure they have a chance to get those to you. So let's say you studied abroad in Madrid, 
and you're applying for an internship that wants to understand your Spanish level, you're going to need that information and you need to build in extra time because people aren't in the office as much, all of those different things. You're going to need writing samples. It might be from a paper you wrote, it might be a brand new piece on a subject, whatever it is, follow directions. That's sort of the bare minimum level of competence, please. But you're also just going to need to, to specify and pay close attention to what each employer is looking for. You might also need recommendations, and I'm happy to talk about letters of rec as we go on. Um, I also just wrote a piece that I'll make sure Natalie has with five broad tips about putting together a quality letter of recommendation. But it's really important that you start to think about who your faculty are, who maybe your internship supervisors are, leaders in your faith community, whatever it is that are going to be able to really talk in specific ways about you. And it's not just about who the most famous name is, it really is about someone who can speak to you and what you've done. So if you are asked for a cover letter, there's really a basic structure that I recommend. Start by getting me interested in you. It should sound like the opening of a newspaper article that's gonna convince me to keep reading. So give me one, maybe two sentences that make me go, ooh, ooh, who is this person? I wanna keep learning more about him or her. Then it should be about me as the employer. What can you do for me? How do your experiences contribute to what I have asked for? How are you going to help me move my organization forward? I appreciate that a lot of people write me application letters about their deep passion and all the things that they want to learn. I don't care. I want to know what you as an employee or as an intern are going to deliver for me. So frame, let's say, those middle two paragraphs. If the opening one is about your level of awesomeness, the middle two paragraphs should be about how you're going to help me be more awesome and why I should want you to be the one who fills that position. And then close it out by talking about what we can do together. What is it about you plus me that's going to really make something even more amazing and better than it would have been without it? Because in that way, I can see very clearly, very close, in a clear connected way between what I want, which is to make my organization succeed, and what you have, how those two things are really gonna help both of us meet our goals. So if you can structure a cover letter in that way and ground it in what the employer is looking for, you're really gonna be able to put together a tight, clear application that's gonna catch my interest. The same thing is true about a resume, and they, they live in a complementary fashion, a resume and a cover letter. You don't know what someone is going to read first. I'm a resume reader first because I'm not going to bother reading full sentences if your bullet points in your resume just stink because I don't, I'm not. Other people want to read the cover letter first because if you can't craft a full and complete sentence, why the hell are they going to bother with your resume? So you really don't know which kind of person is going to be on the other end. So you need to make sure they live together symbiotically. For most of you, if not all of you, this early in your career, your resume should be one page. There's a lot of different schools of thought about this. Um, I'm giving you mine because my mic works and nobody else's does. So feel free to take all of this with a grain of salt. But I think this early, one page is really the best way to encapsulate what you've just simply been on the planet long enough to do. You just haven't been around long enough because you're only, whatever, 22 years old to, to really have built out a multi, multi-page resume. At a bare minimum, if it's got grammar mistakes and spelling mistakes, fix them immediately because also part of this is about me gauging your capacity to do the work that I have and for me to trust you with the work that I have. So if you can't even get your resume right, which is in service of you and your professional life, how can I believe that you're really going to deliver for me and the things that I'm looking for? It should go in reverse chronological order. It should be short, tight bullet points with really clear, concise, and connected information. And the more you can ground it in details, who, what, when, how many, what was the impact, all of those different pieces, the better it's going to be for me to, again, see how what you have is going to help with what I want. And it's going to help me gauge, oh, Christina has done 15 of these for 27 audiences in three countries. All right, well, I only need her to do 10 of these in five countries for, tw for two audiences. So she's exceeded what I'm looking for. She's really going to measure up. But if what I'm looking for is someone who can do 150 of these in 30 countries, I know that she may not be there yet. So ground it in details, give me specifics, but again, in a really short, clear, tight way. And we can, we can translate some different bullets later on if you like, 
but the real focus has to be on the details, on the who and the what and the when, in order to really draw out all of the different accomplishments that you have. It should absolutely have your contact information on there, by the way. I know it doesn't say that on the screen, but both your cover letter and your resume absolutely have to have, at a minimum, your name and your email address. Ideally, your phone number, if you're comfortable with that. Mailing address at this point, nobody's gonna mail you anything, but they might want it to get a general sense of, are you in Washington State, or are you in Washington, D.C.? Like, what's the time zone, those different kinds of pieces. But at a bare minimum, every piece of paper you turn in should have your name and your email, because well, I'm at home now, but my office looks like a whirlwind hurricane came through it, and there's just paper everywhere. So if I find Christina's resume, and three days later I find Christina's cover letter, which is totally plausible, I have to, whichever piece of paper I have in my hand, if I wanna call her, I should be able to do that without having to find the other one. So make sure they go together. I'm just telling you all my terrible sins these days. Um, but make sure that you make it very easy for someone if they want to contact you to do so. So be sure that that's on every single page. If you are lucky enough to get asked to interview, but even just in the forming of your cover letter, be sure you've learned about the company, not just the job, read the about us section, read about how they talk about who they are, but also know the job description, know the position that they're looking for and why they asked what they asked. So that you can say, oh, I see that you wanted this, here's how I can give it to you. If you know who's gonna interview you, it's perfectly reasonable to look them up on LinkedIn to get to know a little bit about them. If you know someone who knows them or you know someone at that company, it's also reasonable to ask to reach out and say, oh, I see, Carmen, that you know someone at Brookings. Like, can you tell me about Brookings? Or could you tell me about them? Or would you mind introducing me? And that way you can just gain more information so that your answers in the interview, your documentation in the cover letter, all of that, again, makes those really clear and easy to see connections. Because if I have to work that hard for it, I'm just, I'm not going to. So the easier you can make it on me, the more likely it is that I will see how you're a fit. If you can, do a quick Google search or work with your career center to think about the different kinds of typical questions you're gonna get. There's a pretty good chance you're gonna get something like, why did you want this job? Or why did you apply? Or how do you fit into this? Or how does this fit with your broader goals? Those sorts of, of common things are stuff you can think through in advance so that you don't sound caught off guard when they ask it. Every career site under the sun publishes, you know, 50 common interview questions, 17 tricky interview questions, 47 questions you never thought anybody would ask you, whatever the heck it is, there's gonna be a million sites you can find online so you can start to, to build out how you wanna answer different things that you're probably likely to encounter. It's also reasonable to stay in contact with a company afterwards and just check in every so often without being annoying to get a sense, hey, how's my application going? Oh, I see, like it didn't really work out. Might there be another fit for me? Can I stay in touch with you? It's all about keeping those relationships alive to make sure that if there is something for you down the line, they're still disposed to, to think well of you. Your LinkedIn profile is another critical piece of this. Most, many, many organizations are gonna check LinkedIn before they interview you. So make sure you have a clear picture, make sure you are easy to find because your name is, is clear. If you go by one name and one isn't your legal name and you, you know whichever name you're most likely to put into a job application, you can use both of them, use one, whatever it is, make sure I can find exactly you, especially if you have a more common name. There's not too many Carmen Yetzi Mazeras out there in the world, so I don't have that problem, but if your name is Ann Smith, yeah, you're gonna need to find ways to stand out Make sure that, again, it's linked to your resume and is rooted in all of those accomplishments that you have. And then use LinkedIn as a great tool to continue to build those networks, follow those groups, be a part of those conversations, and put content into the world that celebrates what you know and what you're interested in. So all of these pieces live together to build up your public professional profile. Some things to do and some things to please don't do. So when it comes time to get recommendations, Please re make rec requests of people who actually know your work well. I have truly read letters of recommendation that say, Natalie is nice. She sat in the front row. That doesn't help me, right? That doesn't help me get a sense of who you are. It doesn't get, help me get a sense of um, what you can do. I've also, on the flip side, gotten 
letters that say, Natalie is my granddaughter and she's the greatest human who's ever walked the earth and can do no wrong and I'm sure is going to cure cancer and move the moon and the earth and the stars, the whole thing, right? So on the flip side of someone who doesn't know you well, a family member, a friend who's really not going to be able to give you an unbiased letter is probably also not going to be your strong suit. It should be someone professional, someone who can speak to your experiences, regardless of what their title is, regardless of how famous you think they are, someone who can really speak to the kinds of things that you've done. It's perfectly reasonable to give your references specific instructions. You know, I know that this job really wants those quantitative skills that I've built. So Professor Mazera, could you talk about this project that we did where I was running data regressions and I was trying to do this and this and this was what we found? Absolutely. I know this position is really looking for someone with a deep call to service who wants to, to serve humanity and, and be a part of this. Could you talk about this paper that I wrote or my volunteer work over here or this and that? It's perfectly fine to give specifics based on what you know the company is looking for. And this is also true for grad schools to, to help shape the letter that comes out. They shouldn't lie for you. They shouldn't make things up. But that doesn't, there's a lot of you to share in a letter, so make sure that the things they choose to draw out in that short amount of time are in service of the narrative that you're trying to put forward. Make sure that they don't write a whole letter about how badly you want to work for Brookings when you're applying to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, right? It's like if you want to work for Boeing and they write a letter about how badly you want to go to Lockheed Martin, Boeing is not going to hire you because the whole thing is about how you want to go work for their competitor. So make sure that the recommender is, is set up to not make foolish mistakes and undercut your candidacy. If right now there's a professor or a faculty member that you really have a close relationship with, it's perfectly fine to ask for a generic letter of recommendation, broadly speaking about your wonderfulness, what that, but then circle back to them when there's a particular job or a particular grad school or a particular organization you want to apply to, and ask them to update that letter. It will be easier for them because they wrote in this moment of thinking about how awesome you are, all of these different traits, but you also want to make sure that it's at a minimum addressed to the organization and not sort of to, to whom it may concern. But also if you can then ask them to highlight some of those specific points, then it will help make a stronger case for you. So if you're worried about losing touch with a faculty member, and we can talk about how not to do that, you know, you can ask for a general letter, but just ask them to revisit it when specific time comes. So <clears throat> I'm about to open the floor up, so please get your questions ready. And I also have the list that Natalie shared, but I wanted to share some of the many different sources and resources that we have through APSIA. We have a ton of events. A lot of them are focused on helping you build relationships with the grad schools that might make sense for you. For example, throughout the month of November, we're running small group open houses around different topics. For anybody interested in global communications or public diplomacy, tomorrow we're having a small group conversation on Zoom uh, with a few of our schools to learn and talk about those kinds of programs. We're doing one in a few weeks on national security, one on cyber, so all of these different topics and themes. If you're trying to think about different fellowships, whether it's paying for undergrad, paying for grad school, work or life experience between undergrad and grad, research, all of those different things. There's the filterable list on our website that you can find. If you're not even sure what schools teach international affairs, we have all of our members and affiliates profiled on our site. It unpacks the degrees they teach and gives you a brief taste of the kinds of school and program that they are. And then as I mentioned, then we have our international career guide as well that goes through a lot of different segments and topics. Across social media, we are always sharing job and internship and fellowship opportunities, uh, alum stories. If you, if you really aren't sure and you're like, oh, that sounds like a cool thing, we really try to put as much of that out through Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn as we can. And then we have a lot of different recordings on our YouTube channel that go more in-depth into different things, including applying to grad school, including different career opportunities. And then here's the, <coughs> the quick plug for our open houses which started in October and go all the way to the end of November. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I see a few questions in the chat, so I will start with those. And then I do have that list, but if you wanna raise your hand, I'm happy to, to preempt some of that and only go back to the list that Natalie sent if we, if we end up getting kind of quiet. So Jack wonders whether passion can be used as a hook. 
Jack, you're asking the wrong person because I personally loathe seeing the word passion in a cover letter because to me it's just an empty way of not being able to show me that, that you really care about the issue. So I personally <laughs> would rather you use more in-depth examples that say, I care about this topic and so therefore I wrote a paper on it, therefore I did an internship on it, therefore I have gone to every event you guys have done on this thing rather than just saying, I have a passion for it. Because anyone can write the sentence, I have a passion for human rights, but show me that that's really true. So it can be used as a gateway in, but I would say only if you actually support it with information that that really is how you feel about that particular topic. Christina wonders if you've worked five jobs, should your resume be one page? Is that the rest of that? No, but at a bare minimum, what I would say is there's a wonderful, powerful world called Word that says selected. So you write work experience, selected. And then of all of those different jobs and positions that you've had, maybe you just pick the couple that are most directly relevant to what that job description is looking for. So one thing that I do is I have like a 40 bajillion page version of my resume. And then I cherry pick between the different things to craft a one or two in my case, because I'm four, you know, much older than you, um, components that tell the story I'm trying to tell. So if you've worked at law firms and hospitals and consulting firms, if it's complementary experience, great, because maybe you need the law firm and the hospital in one case, and you need the consulting firm and the law firm in another case to advance the narrative that you're qualified for a particular position. If it's deepening your experience, then you have a more ability to change them out because maybe you don't, you really wanna focus on two of the three or three of the, there's, there's lots of ways to sort of cherry pick, but because it begins with the word selected at the top of the subject header, the reader knows this is not all Christina has done. There's way more to her than this. And again, the, well, not again, but the point of the resume and the cover letter is to get you the interview. So you don't need to tell me your whole story then. You, you just want to get me interested enough that I want to talk to you. And you can also mention some of the things you left out in your cover letter as a way to say, like, I don't expand on this in my resume, but I also have experience doing X and Y so that they don't look for it on your resume and get lost. So there's lots of ways to sort of cherry pick and, and still have that, that one page really focused resume. And there may also be things that um, and I'm not saying this is you, but in general, if you have stuff from high school on your resume and you're graduating, I would say unless it's extremely indirectly relevant, you don't need it at this point. So there, there's lots of ways to pare stuff down or tighten stuff up to make sure that, that it'll still fit. Heather wonders whether we should include jobs that have nothing to do with your major in education, serving jobs and stuff. Yes, Heather, it makes total sense to include them if, again, they're advancing the skills that you're looking for. So if you were in wait service and maybe you're trying to show somebody that you had detail management or financial management or customer service, if it's a consulting job like Christina had, there's a hell of a lot of customer service in that and being responsive to clients. So there may be some great bullet points to construct from your time as a wait server, as a restaurant server, that are going to speak to your ability to do that. It would absolutely showcase if an employer was looking for detail management. If you were the one who closed out the, the restaurant at night and had to, to deal with all the finances, if you were maybe a shift manager and supervising others, there's tons of stuff to draw out from those experiences and you should include them if it, again, advances the narrative that you are the right person for that particular job. So if it's got technically nothing to do with chemical and biological weapons, that's totally fine. Folks who work in the intelligence community absolutely have customers have to have good customer service skills because when the director of national intelligence calls if you're a jerk and you don't know how to deal with him or her you're in real trouble and if you don't know how to deal with difficult people as i'm sure you have experienced as a server you're in real trouble in the intelligence community so all of that is absolutely relevant even if it doesn't feel like it's in your major um am i talking too loud okay sorry i get i get excited talking about all these things um, so I'm not seeing any other questions right now. So let me turn to the things that you all had asked in advance. How diverse is the field of international affairs and what kinds of skills are recruiters looking for? I think I talked a little bit about this, but um, because we are lucky to have so many different things, we, we generally break 
them up into sort of the public sector, meaning government, local, national, statewide, intergovernmental, the nonprofit sector, typically end in .org, which might be humanitarian service, it might be financial services, it might be business, there's lots of things in that .org space. The private sector, which again could be a social enterprise, it could be a major global bank, it could be your local beer brewer, all of them have a global element to them. And then what we call the multilateral sector, which is the UN, the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization, and there's a million within that space as well. So that's kind of the, um, the, the general buckets that we put things into, but underneath that, there's just a huge amount of, of different options. Um, and feel free to, to keep putting stuff in the chat and I will step away from the questions that you all shape. Um, what advice would I have for solidifying your path on the field? Um, and what does law school look like? So obviously from where I sit, our schools within APSIA are professional schools of international affairs, um, which a law school is a professional school of law, and we are a professional school of international affairs. A lot of our schools might have joint degree programs, but the approaches to the questions that you're going to be tackling are just going to be really distinct between the two different professional schools. So there are people who have law degrees in our space. There are tons of our people in question, in policy making, in international human rights law, in, in all of those different fields. If you aren't sure which of those two professional fields makes the most sense for you, we can talk about some different questions to ask yourself. But I think a lot of people end up in law schools because it's a degree they've heard of, or it's the degree that makes their grandmother happy to tell her friends at the grocery store, that kind of thing. Um, I would argue that's not a good enough reason to go to law school to make your grandmother happy when she goes to the grocery store. So I encourage you to, to look at our space and the, the way a, a, an international affairs graduate program is going to be structured. It's going to let you bring together lots of different elements. It's going to have a core around certain issues and then lots of different electives. And that's going to be really different than the way a law school sort of prescribes the different classes and maybe we'll let you in your last year take some international elements to it but that's after you've taken like civil procedure to learn how to behave in a courtroom if you don't actually want to go into a courtroom spending time and money to learn how to behave in a courtroom may not make the most sense for you so if you're debating between law school and a professional school of ir really look at how they teach and what they teach and don't just go by i have to do one or the other because that's that's just simply not not accurate um, and again, I'm happy to go into more of this as, as folks would find useful. How do students fund in pay, unpaid internships and what are the most accessible internships? Uh, if, you, if you're the, our colleague who asked about the most accessible internships, I'd love to know what you mean by that. Uh, I will say that is one of the bigger benefits of COVID is that so many internships have moved remote. Um, and a lot of the DC based employers, for example, have seen the value of having students located in other parts of the country and the world than they would normally have access to just in DC. So as students going to UCSD, you, you might actually have a competitive advantage to say, look, I bring a West Coast perspective or I bring a perspective of wherever I'm from to your particular internship. Uh, if in terms of accessing internships, again, a lot of it's gonna fall into those buckets. So if you're really interested in research, diving deep into the many different think tanks that might be based in different places. If you're really interested in questions of climate change, maybe there's a business working trying to address climate change like Impossible Burger, or there's a nonprofit that's trying to look at climate change from a carbon capture point. I mean, really thinking about who the actors are among the questions that you're interested in, and then seeing what the different organizations are or the associations. Sometimes it can be as simple as, you know, topic you're interested in and the word association. And that will give you maybe the, the trade association like us that will list all their members. So it's still generally in the space of the issue area you want to deal in, but it's, it's a whole long list of different companies. It would also encourage you to read the bios, the biographies of people who have really cool sounding jobs, even if you don't know anything about them. And as you read it, you may discover different organizations that you would never have heard of otherwise. And then you can go to their site, see if they're offering internships, 
99.5% of them at this point are going to be remote, so they're not going to care where you are as long as you have a stable internet connection and a willingness to do the work. And then the question is take creating that tailored application that gets you noticed. There's some internships I've seen that ask, okay, you know, we are based in Palo Alto, so we really want students who are on Pacific time. We don't care where you are as long as you're generally going to be online and awake when we're online and awake. So if you're in Palo, if, you know, the internship's in Palo Alto and you're in New Delhi, it's not quite so convenient, but they don't care whether you're in Seattle or San Diego as long as you're online when they're online. So you may find some constrictions like that, but for the most part, most internships are remote and so they're, they're open to applicants from anywhere. Um, I'm so glad, uh, even though our colleague has already left us, that they found it useful. Paying for internships, aha. So, um, there was a trend for a while of more and more internships being paid or at least coming with a stipend with the implosion which is probably the nicest word i can come up with of the current financial situation um a lot of that has been paused so i don't know i don't think it's been stopped i think the intention is still there so you may find some internships that uh, will still grant you a stipend, even if it's remote. For example, and I, I just posted this today on, on the Apsia Twitter feed, there's a think tank in DC that works on everything from energy and the environment to transatlantic security to Asia, the Atlantic Council, it is offering remote stipend internships for junior, seniors, and graduate students. Um, and here I'll I don't have their link off the top of my head, but I have ours. Um, so you, you'll be able to find it there, except I didn't send it to everybody because that would have been way too easy. Um, sure, Christina, sorry about that. Um, so we pump out a lot of those kind of things. Um, even for those of you who are in any of the fields of the liberal arts and sciences, Phi Beta Kappa, for example, you don't have to be a PBK student. They are currently seeking remote stipended internships. So there are some positions that, that are gonna come like that. There are other foundations, uh, the BA Rudolph Foundation, BA Rudolph, helps I can spell, um, that is particularly focused on funding women's inter internships for women in different sectors. For those of you who are interested in the legislative process, College to Congress offers paid internships and funding for internships particularly with a, legislative, a, a national federal legislative focus. HNIP technically stands for the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities National Internship Program, which is ridiculously long, which is why we call it HNIP. <coughs> um, anyone can compete for an HNIP internship regardless of your background, but I believe also that UCSD is a member of the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. Don't quote me on that, but I think they are. So there's particular consideration given to students who go to Haku schools. And again, you're linked to something on, with the legislative process. There's also a whole fund uh, through a group called Pay Our Interns, even though I misspelled it, that you can request funding for anything. If you have an internship, they'll give you, it might be money for books, it might be money for groceries, it might be money to pay your internet connection so you can keep up with your internship. It's pretty open. Um, and they prioritize particularly first-gen students and, and a certain subset of other groups. So they're really trying to help students who maybe have even more hills to climb than, than others. So there's lots of different groups. Um, there's one I don't know quite as much about, but the, I think it's the Jeffrey McLean Foundation also is trying to support unpaid internships. So there's some funding that might come from the employer and some that might come from outside groups that might help to make internships more accessible. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat, so I'm just going to keep going with the list, but throw stuff in the chat or, or if I don't think we have any raised hands. Um, so yeah, let me know what else I can answer for those of you who are actually here. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going through the list. Um, what non-governmental job opportunities are available for international students? If you are not uh, a U.S. citizen with broadly defined, so perm res, but I'm with uh, access to work in the the US um, with your OPT you have a year that will enable you to, to do different opportunities 
beyond that year, the key is going to be getting someone who can sponsor your visa, as I'm sure you know. That is something that can be worth unpacking in your cover letter, explaining that you understand that you're going to need support and sponsorship, that you're aware of the different challenges. So to show the employer that you want to be a good partner with them to, to move these questions forward. The current visa process is very, um, there's a lot of question marks about it. So it's hard from the employer's perspective to know specifically what the rules are gonna look like. So it might be an even more difficult time for them to commit to an international student, not because they don't love you and wanna keep you, but simply because they just don't know what the rules are gonna look like. With the election being generally behind us, with some of the wheels of transition starting to, to creep forward, some clarity may be coming around about what the future may look like on those issues that will make people less anxious. The key for an international student is going to be helping the employer show why you are absolutely the person who has to be in that job and not technically a U.S. citizen. So the more support and ammunition you can give an employer to make that case, the easier it is on the nonprofit or on the organization. If you do need sponsorship, I would encourage you to look to larger nonprofits. A small NGO like us, it's really hard for us to navigate the legal and financial just work of doing that that really makes it difficult for us to, to sponsor someone, whereas a larger organization may already have the apparatus set up to do that for folks in a way that I would have to create it myself absolutely as a staff of two. So I'm, I'm, it's harder for me to, to want to climb that hill than an organization where it's just like, oh yeah, you fill out form 27-2 when the wheels start to turn. So if you do want to stay and you do need sponsorship, looking for larger organizations that might be more readily open to that would probably be the easiest way to go. What if you're a U.S. citizen and you just don't want to work for the government? Then Heather, you have 800 billion thousand other options. Tons of nonprofits, for-profit companies, multilaterals, the government is, is one small subset of the much bigger and broader fields. So even if you want to do something like security and defense, which are often, <laughs> um, I'm glad I, I, we're here to please, Heather. Um, so even if you want to do something like security that might be typically thought of as a very intergovernmental activity, there's a ton of work going on in the private sector around questions of security. It might be disinformation. It might be hard security. You know, Facebook has teams and teams of human analysts that go one step farther than the algorithms to understand what security threats are being bred through that particular forum. Netflix has a whole security team. Part of it is to protect their assets, like when they're filming somewhere in the before times. Some of it is to protect their intellectual property. Some of it is to do that risk analysis that I talked about. So you may not think of Netflix as a security company, but they have an international security division that's doing exactly that. Disney, you may not think of as a security company, but they have counterterrorism analysts who are trying to understand what targets, like who might be targeting their hard assets like Disneyland or a cruise ship. They have intellectual property folks. They have supply chain monitors. They have all, you know, political risk analysis. Should we open a Disney, I don't know, Uruguay, whatever. So all of those things that you might think of as traditional government activities are absolutely happening in the private sector and in the public and in the nonprofit sector. So you have, <laughs> um, Christine, if you get a job at Disney, I demand uh, Moana toys till the cows come home, whatever. So um, Moana is my daughter's favorite. Anyway. Um, you know, there's a million different opportunities that don't have to end in .gov. And even if you do feel called into public, the public space, there's a ton of jobs in Sacramento if you want to stay in California. There's jobs in the local government, even just in San Diego. There's obviously a huge port. The Navy is there, which is, yes, the federal government, but a different part of the federal government than the State Department or the Transportation Department and its huge international division. So. It, there's so many different elements to it that there's no one thing you have to do or only one thing that you can do. I know we only have a couple minutes left. 
I want to be sure to leave you all. This is my email. Um, so feel free to drop me a line. Just please be sure in the subject to actually tell me who you are and how we know each other. I get a lot of emails that are just entitled hello and I usually delete them because they're scary and shady. So please be sure you tell me how we met. Um, I am one of those persnickety people who am a little cautious about who I connect with on LinkedIn simply because that gives you access to my personal information and like my birthday. So um, Christina, let's have a couple more chats before we, we do the LinkedIn thing. And I know that that's not LinkedIn best practice. You're supposed to just connect with everybody. I'm just start, like curmudgeon and don't like to. Um, so, oh, you know, it's always worth trying on LinkedIn. Always be sure to include a note that tells me who you are. I also get a lot of random those. Um, and I'm not just in this case, but explain to someone who you are and why you want to connect with them. Uh, particularly if it's, say, a UCSD alum. Say, I'm a UCSD student. I found your profile. I think you sound really cool. Could we connect? It's also perfectly reasonable, particularly in DC, but not only to do what's called an informational interview request. Hey, Carmen, I saw your bio. You know, could you talk about yourself for an hour and I would just listen? Well, yeah, who doesn't want to do that? So it's perfectly reasonable to seek someone out to try to, to hear more about their life experiences. Go one step beyond just, hey, can you, do you have a job? Right? Try to draw out some actual wisdom that's implementable for you. Because if you start with, can I have a job? And they say no, there's sort of nowhere else for the conversation to go. So think about the kinds of things you actually want to learn from them beyond just that when you make an informational interview request, but it's perfectly reasonable to do that. And starting even just with your alumni network, within the huge sphere that is UCSD or even the whole UC system can be a, a really good way to just start opening some doors. Because I'm sure whatever you're interested in, you are not the first person who's interested in that. So there's plenty of others out there to do that. So I know we're, we're pretty much at time, but do feel free to email me. Uh, I'm not curmudgeoning about that and happy to set up times to talk more specifically about stuff and go from there. I will make sure Natalie has my slides and all of the inf other information that we, we have through the Apsia family. So thank you for inviting me and uh, I look forward to, to connecting with you all later. Yeah, thank you for having us, Carmen. It was a really